this lecture, we will continue our review and focus on rational functions, and in particular, Hill functions. And we will extend the same dominating power analysis to actually come up with pretty detailed sketches of both of those types of functions. In general, rational functions are functions of this form. f of x is a polynomial p of x divided by the polynomial q of x. So a ratio of two polynomial functions. Now, of course, we cannot divide by zero, so the denominator here will not be allowed to be zero. Rational functions come with asymptotes, vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, and slant asymptotes, which we will not really talk about, so I'm not going to really review. Vertical asymptotes are fairly easily calculated if we have a rational functions in simplest terms, which means that the denominator and the numerator do not share factors, then vertical asymptotes will be produced when the denominator of the function, or the bottom of it, is equal to zero. Horizontal asymptotes are going to have to be sli calculated slightly differently. So if we think in terms of the vertical asymptotes, they're the things where as the function approaches the asymptote, it goes off to either positive or negative infinity as it approaches an asymptote here. Whereas for horizontal asymptotes, it's not near the asymptote behavior in terms of x. Rather, a horizontal asymptote is a value that the function approaches as the x values become larger and larger in either the positive or the negative directions, which means that for horizontal asymptotes, we're going to look at the end behavior of the function and take the limit of our function as x goes to positive or negative infinity. If this limit comes out to be a number, then the horizontal asymptote exists. If this limit comes out to be infinity, that means that the function itself grows unboundedly and therefore there is no horizontal asymptote. In terms of rational functions, there are of course infinitely many of different types, but we will be interested in particular uh, in so-called Hill functions. And these are rational functions of a very particular kind, the functions that look like this, where a and b are constants and the powers of x are the same on top and the bottom. Hill functions are named after the British physiologist Archibald Hill, who studied them in a variety of applications, and in particular in protein binding and muscle physiology that he actually received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for in 1922. Because of their applications, we will consider these functions mainly for positive values of x. Um, they will model things like population growth, disease dynamics spread, and once again, enzyme kinetics. So these will be things like the number of, um, the number of infected people, the number of um, animals or humans in the population, or concentrations, and therefore be positive. Now, we can again, of course, sketch this using technology, but we will use the dominating power analysis to really figure out what these functions look like. Let's take a look at one particular example here. So I have 5x squared over 3 plus x squared. This is what we would call a quadratic Hill function because we notice that x is to the power of 2 in both top and bottom. Now, if I am to sketch this, um, we will apply the dominating power analysis for small and large values of x, but in order to sketch at least some point on the graph, let's compute the intercepts of this function. So for the x-intercept, I'm going to set y to be 0, which means that what I have is 5x squared over 3 plus x squared has to be 0. And now I'm going to look a little bit closer at this. What this is saying is that I have a fraction equals to 0. Well, the only way a fraction is ever 0 is if the top of it is 0, which will give me 5x squared is equal to 0, which of course will then give me that x is equal to 0. If I were to compute the y-intercept, I'm going to set x to be 0, and then what am I going to get? I'm going to get 5 times 0 squared over 3 plus 0 squared, so 0 divided by 3, or 0. So my only intercept of this function is at the origin, when x is 0 and the y is 0. Good to know. This gives me a point to plot on the graph. Now, I am going to utilize the power analysis, which means I'm going to analyze what my function looks like for small values of x as well as what it looks like for large values of x.
So what am I going to have in each case? I'm going to think about what my function will approximately look like here. I am uh, looking at this hill function here. It's a rational function, which means it has the numerator and denominator. For small values of x, the power analysis suggests that the small powers will dominate. I will analyze the top and the bottom separately. So let's look at the top here. Well, there's only one power function on top, so I don't have a choice between what dominates what. 5x squared will be there no matter what I pick, whether it's the small values or the large values of x. On the bottom, though, I have a choice between two terms. The power function 3, it is a power function, it's just a bit of a trivial one. It's 3 times x to power 0, which is just 1. So this is a power function, and x squared is a power function too. So among these two, I have to pick the one that will dominate for my particular case. If I'm looking at the small values of x, I know that the small, uh, smaller powers dominate, so I have to pick one of these, which is the smallest. Now again, this is like 3x to power 0, so the, function, the power function among these two that has the smaller power is, of course, the 3. So this is what is going to remain for the... Mm, So let's take a look at what I have here. My function is 5x squared over 3 plus x squared. What's going to happen to the numerator and denominator for small values of x? What are they going to approach? Well, in the numerator, I don't really have a choice. There's only one term there, 5x squared, so I have to keep it. But on the denominator, I have two power functions to pick from, 3 and x squared. For small values of x, the smaller power will dominate. So which term has the smaller power? Is it the term that is a 3 or is it the term that is x squared, which has a smaller power of x? Well, you can say 3 doesn't have a power of x at all, and that's true, except for we can rewrite this as 3x to power 0, and then it's easier to compare and it becomes very clear that 3 is the term that has the smaller power of x, which means that it will dominate for smaller values of x. For small values of x, I'm going to only keep the smallest power of x. For large values of x, I'm going to do the analogous um, analysis, but keep in mind that for large values of x, large powers dominate. Again, on top, I don't have a choice. There's only one term, so I have to keep it. But on the bottom, I have to choose between 3 and x squared, and I have to keep the largest power of x. 3 and x squared. x squared is the term with the largest power of x, so I'm going to ignore the 3 and keep the x squared. Now that means that for small values of x, my function behaves like 5x squared over 3, and for large values of x, my function behaves like 5x squared over x squared. Now I can rewrite both of these in a slightly more uh, visually sort of pleasing or visually suggesting way. So for example, I can rewrite this as 5 thirds x squared, and it makes it very clear immediately that this is just a parabola with a positive coefficient, so an upside-looking parabola. Whereas this term altogether, I can see that I can actually cancel x squares and overall end up with 5, a constant. Recall that what I am doing here, really, when I am analyzing what happens for large values of x, is taking um, analysis of end behavior of the function, which corresponds to the horizontal asymptotic behavior. Now, with all of this information, I can already sketch the graph of the function. Remember that I'm only interested in doing so for positive values of x, so I'm not even going to bother drawing any other quadrants. So what I have discovered is that my function has to go through the origin, so I can plop the point over here. For small values of x, 
my function looks like an upside facing parabola. So this right here is 5 thirds x squared. And what I know is that for large values of x, my function has to look like 5, which is, of course, a horizontal asymptote of my function. So if my function has to look like something of a parabola here and has to approach the horizontal asymptote of 5 here, I can just connect the two pieces into a shape that looks like this. Now, again, remember that this is a qualitative analysis, which means I'm not actually interested in the scale on other of the axes, well, except for the 5 here. Once we um, discover other uh, potential qual quantities or qualities about this function, we might have to put more information on the graph. This is one of the Hill functions, but remember that the actual powers can differ. And in fact, one of the biggest applications of the Hill functions, and in particular linear Hill functions, are in enzyme and substrate reactions. This is the general biological setup for these reactions. So what happens is I have some sort of an enzyme with an active site. I will add substrate into the actual mix, and this substrate will bind into the enzyme. Once it binds, a reaction happens, and the substrate is converted into two separate pro pro products, in this case, fructose and glucose. Once the conversion happens, these guys leave the active site, and the site becomes active or empty again, available for binding once again. Now, it makes it very clear that the more active sites I have and the more um, binding that can happen, the faster the reaction will be. But also, if the concentration of substrate is so high that all of the active sites are taking up all the time, then the reaction will not be able to proceed any faster than already is. This is what gives rise to what we call michaelis menten kinetics. And this is what the um, scientists notice, is that the speed of the chemical reaction, of course, depends on the concentration of the substrate with two important quantities, qualities. That with no substrate, there is no reaction, so the speed is zero. With high concentration, the speed reaches some maximal level above which it's simply not going to go. This behavior is what is known as michaelis menten kinetics and is described with a linear Hill function. So the Hill function where the actual powers are one, linear. This behavior was first discovered and analyzed by the German, um, the German biochemist Leonor Michaelis and the Canadian physician Maud Menten. Maud Menten actually has a bit of a local to us, local BC history, because she went to high school um, in Chilliwack and in fact spoke, spoke Halkamalum in her high school. I encourage you to look both of these people up. Maud Menten is one of the first female mathematicians to receive a doctorate degree in Canada and has generally a fascinating life story. So take a look, just Google her name, go on Wikipedia and read about some of the most interesting um, scientists of the 1900s. Now, this is, again, a Hill function. So this is something that we can analyze using the power analysis and therefore be able to produce a reasonable graph of. Now, trying to um, replicate the analysis from before, let's talk about the near origin behavior or the behavior for small values of x and the end behavior, so the behavior for large values of x. I'm introducing a slightly different vocabulary here because we will interchange between the two. So once again, I'm just going to rewrite my function for both of those cases, first of all, and then think about what it actually behaves like near the origin and far away from the origin. Near the origin, we're talking about small values of x, so I'm going to look at top and bottom separately, keeping that in mind. Just as before, on top, I don't have a choice. I don't have more than one term, so I'm going to have to keep the term that I have. But on the bottom here, in the denominator, near origin means small values of x. So between the two terms, I have to pick the term that has the smaller 
power of x in it. And that is, of course, my constant term b here. So near the origin, my function will actually behave like this. And as before, it might be better off to separate the constant from the variable to make it clear that what this is is some constant times x. So this is simply a line, right? It's linear. It's just x to power 1 here. And what this represents then, of course, is the slope. So this is a line of slope a over b. Analyzing this function uh, for large values of x, again, on the top, I don't have a choice. I have to keep the term that I have. And on the bottom, I have to pick between the two the term that has the highest power of x, which, of course, is x itself. So I'm going to have ax over x. My x's can cancel, and I'm going to get an a, which is the horizontal asymptote for my function. And in fact, notice that this will always be the case. Because the powers of x in every hill function are the same on top and on the bottom, that means that for the end behavior, I'm always going to keep these two terms and disregard the constant term on the bottom, which means that the x's will cancel, and this a will always end up being my horizontal asymptote for all the hill functions. Okay, so let's sketch this out to see what that would look like. Again, I'm only interested in positive values of x because in this case x actually represents the concentration of the substrate which cannot be negative near the origin my behavior is the line of slope a over b so it's linear there we go and i can even note this slope a over b and at the end for large values of x it approaches the value of a so this is my horizontal asymptote, and my function will look like this. In their original findings, Michaelis and Menten also noticed another really interesting property of the um, enzyme kinetics, and that is the fact that at small concentrations, if you double the concentration, then the speed of the reaction grows fairly quickly. So if I take this as my original concentration and I double it, to this point here, so from here, let's say to here, my speed goes from this value to this value up here, right? So my speed basically doubles in the sketch that I have produced. At small concentration, if you double a small concentration of the substrate, the speed of the reaction grows greatly. However, if the concentration is already high and you double that, the change in the reaction speed is going to be quite small. Look at the graph, right? At this concentration, the speed of the reaction is up here. At this concentration, the speed of the reaction is up here. And the differences, of course, in the y values are really very, very small. This is a very small difference in the reaction speed here. This is also what actually caused them to think about the Hill functions as something that represents the enzyme kinetics reactions and this was in fact a third defining quant quality of these reactions we've seen an example of a quadratic specific quadratic hill function we've analyzed the linear hill function also known as michaelis menten kinetics now we're going to think about what the linear hill function the quadratic hill function and the cubic hill function look like on the same graph together and how they interact what we've noticed in the analysis before is if I take all of these functions and I think about how they behave on the end behavior, I've already mentioned this, is that that means that every time I'm actually ignoring the constant. And this also means that within each function, the corresponding values of x will cancel. So all of the Hill functions have the following property in common, is that they all have a horizontal asymptote at this constant a. So if I were to draw all of these functions on the same graph together, I know that I'm actually only uh, needing to produce one horizontal asymptote, and that is the asymptote at this value of a that they will approach. Now, what about the near origin behavior? Near origin behavior means that I'm ignoring the highest power on the bottom and on the top, I'm keeping what's there, so everything. 
So near the origin, I'm going to have a over bx for the linear function, which means a line of slope a over b. For the quadratic function, I'm keeping a over bx squared, which means a parabola. And for the cubic hill function, I'm keeping a over bx cubed, which means a cubic shape. So for my linear function, I am going to have a line near the origin that then turns into uh, more of a plateau shape as it approaches the um, horizontal asymptote. For the quadratic one, I have to have a parabola near the origin, so something that looks like a parabola near the origin, and then approaches the horizontal asymptote. But now remember that the higher the power, the faster it will approach the asymptote, the domination will take over at some point, so my functions will have to switch at some point in the middle from the flatter near origin behavior of the higher power to the domination for larger values of x. So for my quadratic hill function, this is the behavior that I'm looking at. Now notice here that uh, I am drawing these little bits and pieces for the negative values of x, but that is just so I can get a grasp on drawing the actual parabola and drawing the actual line, and then drawing the actual cubic. So for the cubic, again, thinking of our dominating power analysis, the cubic is the highest degree, which means that it's going to be the flattest near the origin and is going to approach the asymptote the fastest. So what I am going to witness here is the flattest and then the fastest. Now, of course, depending on the coefficients, this switch point might not happen all at the same time, but this is what I'm keeping as my graph for these functions here. Right? So the actual powers not only determine the near origin um, behavior, the near origin shape, they also decide which function will approach the asymptote fastest. Now, these are what we call continuous functions. They are where every single point corresponds to the point on the graph. On the flip side, we might have something that is given by data points that are discrete. So let's take a look at this application of the sockeye salmon population in Skeena River. Skeena River is the river um, in the north of BC. So we in Abbotsford and Chilliwack, we're just in the general lower mainland, is somewhere around here. Um, this is the Skeena River um, River Delta. And so the salmon is what has the salmon population in the Skinner River has been tracked really carefully from the early 1900s and we have a lot of data that's connected to the population numbers of salmon in the Skinner River so this is something that we can model mathematically generally salmon population is tracked fairly closely in British Columbia because this is one of the sources of course one of the biggest industries here but in particular it is a very important industry has always been for the indigenous peoples of British Columbia Salmon has a really fascinating cycle of life. Not only do they breed in only specific freshwater lakes, their offspring migrate to the ocean to mature and they return to the exact same lake or riverbed to where they were hatched to in fact produce the offspring. Once they breed, they die and they feed um, their remaining, like their remains feed the actual um, environment around them. Um, and then once their offspring hatch, the exact same cycle repeats over and over again. Kina River is home to Shimshian and Gitshan nations whose names are beautiful, meaning inside the river of the mist and people of the river of the mist. Because Skeena salmon is of the high importance to indigenous people and because the area has been mostly ineffected by the industrial human development in the early 1900s, we have very good data on the salmon population and how it actually reproduces and what that means for salmon numbers without a lot of industrial human intervention. These are the numbers of salmon in thousands as they have been tracked through the early 1900s um, in in the salmon river in the Skeener river so what we would like to do as mathematicians of course is to be able to predict these numbers into the future so for example if you tell me the 
size of the population in one year based on the previous data and my previous knowledge and general knowledge of how salmon reproduces, how can I predict the number of salmon the following year? So what I did was simply take these numbers and come up with a mathematical model. Now, because the data here is what we call discrete, which means given at only specific point and not at every single year throughout, um, you can think of this as the analog of, let's say, Newton's method, where the entire process is iterative, right? So if I have x naught as my initial population, the following year I'm going to have x1, the year after I'm going to have x2, x3, and so on. Now you can see here that my intervals are always at four years, so I can keep the indices here sequential as well. So I just put together these numbers and I came up with the following formula that x sub n plus 1, so the n plus first iteration, so the n plus first steps from my initial population of 1098 in year 1908, the formula looks like this. I have 8.9637 xn all over 1 plus 0 0.0111 Eight nine nine xn. Now, real data produces sometimes really quite complicated looking things. But if you just squint at it a little bit and recognize that these are just pretty, uh, pretty big constants, you will see that the general structure is familiar. This is simply a Hill function, a discrete analog of a Hill function. I have some kind of a number here, a constant, times x, 1 plus some kind of constant here, times the x. Not only is this a Hill function, this is a linear Hill function, so I know fairly well how it's going to behave. Now, just to get the hang of these uh, computations with the indices and to remind ourselves sort of how this works out, what I would encourage you to do is to try to calculate, given this formula, try to figure out what is x1, given that x0 is the number in 1908, so 1098. And then again, just to get the hang of using this big ugly looking formula, try to calculate x2, given that x1 is 740. Remember that this is the formula that I came up with for this data, but I've actually only used up the first two years. So the further we go into the future, the more inaccurate my model will become and will have to be adjusted. But because this is a discrete analog of a Hill function, we can actually generalize this and we can sketch this fairly well. Now, I could have used any other function to model this with, but I chose the linear Hill function specifically because this is closely related, or rather this is exactly uh, one of the most accurate and uh, precise formulas for the description of the fish population growth known as the beverton holt model. Now, in general, the model relates the population this year, x1, to the population of last year, x0, but it actually works best for fish populations. This is the general formula, again, just a standard Hill function of degree 1. Um, and so the only other thing that is different from this than the general Hill function is the fact that the coefficients look slightly different. So the A and B here are not quite in the same place, and we insist on this being 1 in the most standard Bevel beverton holt model description. Okay, so just because of the slight difference, let's go through the analysis and sketch this x1 as a function of x0 to see if it has a very clear um, connection to the michaelis menten kinetics and the linear Hill functions. Okay, so just like we did before, near the origin and end behavior, let's go through this and see if we're going to see something similar as we, as we expect to see. So what do I have here for x1? Let me rewrite this, ax0 over 1 plus bx0. So what am I going to see near the origin? Near the origin is where I care about the small values of x, which means this is where I care for smaller powers of x. 
on top I have no choice I have to keep the only term there is and on the bottom remember that my variable is x naught between these two terms I am looking for the term with the smaller power of x which is the constant term so I'm going to keep the one here so rewriting this slightly I have a x naught so what I have is a line of slope a for the end behavior I'm going to see that I have once again the exact same function I'm going to keep the top because there is no terms to choose from but on the bottom for the end behavior for large values of x I have to keep the larger power of x which is bx naught so bx naught here I can see that my x nots cancel and I have a over b so my horizontal asymptote here is not the coefficient on top but rather the ratio of the coefficients a over b so when I'm sketching my function I just have to be careful as to how I label the slope near the origin and the eventual horizontal asymptote so my horizontal asymptote has to be a over b and near the origin my function is a line of slope a so it still is a linear hill function but the coefficients did affect just slightly what the actual constants mean the shape will be the same as the shape of the general hill function um, except for once again the constants will be slightly different now notice that I am slightly lying with this graph and that is because my graph shouldn't be a continuous smooth function. I am given numbers of population one year, next year, the year after, and so on. So I actually don't have a continuous smooth curve. What I have really is a bunch of points that will lie four years apart in our case, like for example, in the Skeena Salmon River example, but they will really not be connected to each other because we don't have data points for everything um, in the middle. Now let's think a little bit more about what these A and B mean in terms of our graph. Notice that the larger value of A, the steeper the initial slope will be, and if A is bigger, that means that this horizontal asymptote will be higher. So larger values of A mean the steeper original slope and the higher plateau level for my function. If I fix the A and I increase the value of B, this does not at all affect near the origin behavior, but this will affect the horizontal asymptote. For fixed A, if B is higher, that means I'll be dividing by a larger number which means that the overall fraction will be lower. So higher value of B means lower plateau level for the population. Now, what are the kinds of questions can we ask in this setup? Let's take a look at this here. Is there a population level X naught that would be exactly the same one year to the next? Which means that is there a population at which the process will stabilize. This year's population will be exactly the same as next year's population. And we're asked to compute this for the Skeena sockeye salmon as well. Let's compute this in general and then plug in our particular data. Let's take a look at our model here and really think about what it represents. So X naught is the population last year. So the model says that given the population last year, if I plug this into this formula, it will predict the population for this year. What our current question is asking is when the two of them will be the same. So the population from next year, which our model predicts to be this, has to equal to the population from this year, which is actually x naught. Okay? So Take a look at this again as compared to the formula with the actual population growth. I would like next year's population, x1, to be exactly the same as this year's population, x0. Once I have this equation, I simply have to solve for x0 in terms of a and b because those are just constants.
So what I can do here? Well, first of all, I can just cross multiply to get rid of denominators. So what am I going to get? I'm going to get that x naught times 1 plus bx naught is equal to ax naught. I can move this term to the left and factor x naught out. So I'm going to have, let me do this in two steps. I've moved this over to the left, and then I notice that this big term has x naught, and this term has x naught as well. So I can take it out of the entire brackets. And in the brackets, I'm going to have 1 plus bx naught from this term here. And once this x naught traveled outside, I'm going to have minus a is equal to 0. And once again, factoring is fantastic because either that means that x naught is equal to 0, or it means that this entire bracket is equal to 0. So x naught equals to 0 means that this year I have no population. Well, if there's no salmon this year, there's not going to be salmon next year. So this is one of what we call stable points or equilibria. What about this equation? Can I solve it for x naught? Well, let's see. If I move 1 and minus a over to the right, I get a minus 1, and then I can divide by b to get the solution to this. There are a couple of things I have to be mindful of here. First of all, if I have a ratio like this, I need to ensure that b cannot be 0, because otherwise I won't be able to compute with it. But also, keeping in mind that x naught is the size of the population, it means that this number has to be positive. So far, my only restrictions have been on a and b being positive. But notice that here, I also have to insist that a is actually bigger than 1. So that when I subtract 1, I still end up with a positive number. So my a has to be bigger than 1. And then I have these two possible population sizes that are going to produce the population that's exactly the same one year to the next. What do we compute for Skeena salmon? Well, there I can simply plug in the numbers that I have for A and B. So I'm going to have A minus 1 divided by B. My value for A was 8.9637, and then I have to subtract the 1 divided by b, which was 0 0.0111899. So if I compute this all together, it turns out to be 711 thousandths of salmon. So what this means is that for Skeena River salmon, if the process continues the way that it has and nothing changes environmentally drastically, that if I have 711 thousand salmon one year, then that's exactly the same number as I'm going to have the next year and exactly the same number as I'm going to have the year after. Now, of course, in nature, nothing ever is that stable. So we notice that even when the numbers were near 711, they did not produce the exact same number the year after because, again, nature is a little bit more complex than any mathemat mathematical model can describe it as. And this is why studying nature is particularly exciting.